Good morning. To the faculty, administration, students, and invited guests of Westminster community, I give thanks to God for you and for the opportunity to give this Harrell Lecture this year. I give special thanks, of course, to Roger and Jeannie Harrell for making this event and the Harrell Professorship possible. I want you to know that on a personal note, Lindley and I cherish our friendship with you very much, our partnership with you in the church, and Westminster as a whole is grateful for you. The title and subject matter of this lecture may come as a surprise to some at Westminster. We are more accustomed to hearing in our hallowed halls the names of Calvin and Machen than Marx and Cohn. Yes, the Karl in the title refers to the 19th century philosopher and social revolutionary Karl Marx. And the Cone refers to James Cone, the former professor of systematic theology at Union Theological Seminary and a founder of Black Liberation Theology. On the surface, these two thinkers may not have much in common. The one, an ethnic Jew from the 19th century, the other, an African American from the 20th. The one, an atheistic German immersed in German philosophy and leftist politics, the other, an American theologian trying to reckon, reckon with the evil of racism and Jim Crow laws and to further the struggle among blacks for racial justice during and after the civil rights movement. But I hope to show you that at a deeper level, these two men are linked by common bonds, bonds that Christians would do well to consider as we seek to promote justice in society. Cornell West, Harvard professor, philosopher, activist, and co-star with Keanu Reeves in the 2003 action hit The Matrix Reloaded, has argued that in their respective approaches to economic and racial inequality, Marx and Cohn are similar in a number of ways. First, West says, the traditions that each man spawned adopt a method, West calls it a dialectical method, that questions and then transforms a given topic, either in whole or in part. Marx applies this method to capitalist society. Cohn applies it to the Christian gospel that he was taught as a young man. Second, West says, the traditions of Marx and Cohn seek socioeconomic liberation on behalf of the oppressed. And who are the oppressed? In Marx's day, the oppressed were the laborers, the proletariat. Cohn has in view oppressed black Americans in the main. And third, West argues, both traditions critique the power dynamics they see as even yet embedded in liberal capitalist America. Perhaps at this point you're agreeing with me that this is not your typical Westminster lecture. But it is a lecture designed for the Westminster community. This is a lecture designed to help students and friends of the seminary analyze and wisely evaluate influential worldviews, and hopefully to do so from a loving and scripturally grounded perspective. This is my widest goal. But I also want to shed light on the thought of Marx and Cohn themselves, especially as that thought relates to the topic of social justice. What is social justice for Karl Marx and James Cohn? How do their respective worldviews affect their definitions of social justice? Relatedly, what should social justice mean for us today? Should we be for it? Should we be against it? Where does God and the gospel fit in? Perhaps most controversially, did Cornell West really star in The Matrix Reloaded? These are, I'm sure you'll agree, important questions. And yes, he did. If these are the goals, what will I argue? Well, here's what I'll argue. Both Marx and Cohn hold that human identity is acquired gained, even defined by the successful pursuit of social justice through human revolution. Now, beneath 
this thesis is another idea shared by Marx and Cohn. And that shared idea is that one's sense of self, one's consciousness, defines one's identity. To put it in three words, mind constitutes reality. Now, this is important to recognize because both Marx and Cohn will prioritize having a fully realized consciousness or sense of self, a sense of self that develops through the struggle for social justice. And so on their account, where consciousness develops, so too does human identity. Now, you may realize that the idea that my sense of self defines who I am has relevance to cultural issues far beyond the purview of this lecture. But for now, get this. For Marx and Cohn, social justice forges a right consciousness, and consciousness defines what is real. Though their approaches will differ, I'm arguing that it's in this sense for both thinkers, human identity is acquired through the struggle for social justice. Second, as you can see, I'll argue that a reformed view of social justice presupposes the personhood and dignity and humanity of all people as God's image. And I'll offer a few guidelines for developing a reformed account of social justice according to a redemptive historical reading of Scripture. At this point, let me give the catch-all qualification that we can't say everything, that these thoughts are my own, that the Matrix trilogy runs downhill after part one, and <laughs> that there are many more influences and legacies and interpretations of Marx and Cohn that we don't have time to cover. But my ultimate hope is that we would be strengthened in the Spirit together to look to Christ speaking in the Scriptures when dealing with social challenges like wealth inequality and racism and more. Before we turn to Marx, we should recognize that in a fascinating irony of history, the term social justice was actually coined by a 19th century Jesuit philosopher, this man named Luigi Tapparelli. Interestingly, Tapparelli wrote in the same general context as Karl Marx. Amid political turmoil in Italy, in the wake of the French Revolution, during the challenges of the Industrial Revolution. But different from Marx, Tapparelli was interested in how God had designed an order to society. Specifically, he explored how people, according to their own virtues and abilities, organize into groups within society, with each group being ordered to the common good. Tapparelli was a Jesuit. He believed in Thomas Aquinas' definition of justice. What was Aquinas' definition of justice? It was roughly the constant willingness to give each person his due. And in his work, Tapparelli's work, a theoretical treatise on natural law resting on fact, he sought to apply Aquinas' definition of justice to the social groups people form in society. That is, he asked, what does Thomas's justice look like when we apply it to, say, the family or the school district or professional partnerships or political alliances all the way up to the national state? What rights belong to these groups? Not only what rights, but what are our duties toward one another as members of society and especially as members of these different associations? And basically for Tapparelli, social justice meant that we owe people the freedom to pursue the good ends for which they form particular associations within society. As cultural studies professor Thomas Baer puts it, for Tapparelli, social justice is both a norm and a habit of promoting the common good by encouraging the free exercise of the rights of persons especially in the context of the various associations they freely form in society. On this account, social justice is a virtue of a flourishing society in which different groups are free to pursue their own ends according to the rights they enjoy from God. Of course, there's more to say and 
to critique about Taparelli's Catholic theology, his conception of natural law, the common good, and perhaps more. But the point is, he believed that the pursuit of social justice required a stable metaphysical and moral order. How different is the social justice advanced by Karl Marx and then James Cohn? Whereas Taparelli saw social justice as the exercise of rights and the fulfillment of duties among all people within the groups they legitimately form under God, Marx sees social justice from an atheistic and materialist perspective. In fact, for Karl Marx, social justice requires the abolition of groups like the family, the church, business associations, and so on, all of which are to give way to a communist world order. And to go back to our thesis, for Marx, human beings acquire their identity through the process that achieves this world order, an order in which all people have an equal possession of earthly power. Now, to grasp this project, especially how human identity is realized in the pursuit of this project, we need to do a little bit of philosophical digging. We need to go back, at least, to the quintessential Enlightenment thinker, Immanuel Kant. Now, Kant wins the award of having written the most intractable treatise in the Western canon, a total sleeper known as the Critique of Pure Reason. Okay, hang with me. If you can stay awake reading it, you will find that Immanuel Kant lays the foundation for defining the human self in terms of the mind and apart from God's revelation. This is what he says. Hitherto, it has been assumed that all of our knowledge must conform to objects. Okay, pause right there. We must think in accord with the way the world really is, he's saying. Many people have thought. But all attempts have on this assumption ended in failure. We should add, ended in failure apart from consideration of God and His revealed Word. We must therefore make trial whether we may not have more success in the tasks of metaphysics if we suppose that objects must conform to knowledge. In a nutshell, Kant is arguing that our experience of the world and ultimately our experience of ourselves is not made possible by God as the Lord and Creator of all. Rather, your sense of the world, your sense of yourself as a self, is the product of the active organizational powers of your own mind. To put it bluntly, Kant was saying that your mind, technically your faculty of understanding, operating apart from divine revelation, actively constructs what you take to be real. This particular formulation was unprecedented in the history of Western philosophy. Now, Kant was not a relativist. He believed that everyone's minds basically constructed human experience in the same way. And in that sense, within his system, reality, or at least our perception of reality, was still somewhat stable. But the idea that the mind constructs experience and does so in a much more fluid and dynamic way, comes to us from yet another German philosopher, George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Hegel outdid Kant, saying that it's not just that your individual mind organizes your experience of the world that lies beyond your mind. Rather, the world and its history, ultimate reality itself, just is nothing but the unfolding of a single, all-embracing mind coming to self-consciousness through your individual mind. Hang with me. We're about to come up for air. Listen to how Peter Singer, yes, the atheistic bioethicist Peter Singer, summarizes Hegel's argument in his classic work, The Phenomenology of Mind. Okay, so this is Peter Singer on Hegel responding to Kant so that we would understand Marx. <laughs> Reality is constituted by mind. 
At first, mind does not realize this. It sees reality as something independent of it, even as something hostile or alien to it. Only when mind awakens to the fact that reality is its own creation can it give up this reaching after the beyond. Then it understands that there is nothing beyond itself. Then it knows reality. That is, the cosmic mind knows reality as directly and immediately as it knows itself. It is at one with it. As Hegel puts it in the conclusion section of the phenomenology, absolute knowledge is mind knowing itself in the shape of mind. What Singer is saying is that it all comes back to the matrix, okay? Okay, that's the last matrix reference, I promise. Seriously, what is Hegel saying? Hegel is saying that who you are is determined by your position along the logical journey of a cosmic mind coming into self-consciousness. He's saying that your identity, your existence is acquired as you overcome the alienation in thinking that there is an external world beyond your mind, much less that there is a God in heaven. This is the most radical expression of the idea that consciousness or mind determines what is real and, in fact, is what is real. If you want a label for it, it's called dialectical idealism. Okay, now let's turn to Karl Marx. Marx said that Hegel was way too in the clouds. Maybe you're thinking the exact same thing. What we need, Marx said, is a philosophy that speaks to the real needs of real people. As he famously wrote, Philosophers have hitherto only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. Well, how did Marx change the world? He changed the world by taking Hegel's philosophy and turning it upside down. He changed it by taking Hegel's dialectical idealism and replacing it with a dialectical materialism. For Marx, this meant that human personhood does come about by way of development, but not a logical development, rather an economic development. This is what I mean. Marx said that what defines who you are is not some all-embracing mind coming into self-consciousness through individual minds. Rather, Marx said your sense of self and therefore your identity is defined by your economic location within society's journey toward a materialistic utopia. Listen to Marx. In direct contrast to German philosophy, which descends from heaven to earth, here we ascend from earth to heaven. Men developing their material production and their material intercourse alter along with this their real existence their thinking and the products of their thinking. Life is not determined by consciousness, Hegel, but consciousness by life. For Marx, Hegel was right to say there is no metaphysical essence that defines human beings. Personhood is constituted within a matrix of development and relationships. But Marx said Hegel was wrong to say that this matrix of relationships was a logical development. No, what defines human consciousness and therefore human identity is simply the struggle between economic classes leading to a communist revolution. Again, Marx wrote, it is not the consciousness of men that determines their existence, but their social existence that determines their consciousness. And this is how it happens. At a certain stage of development, the material productive forces of society come into conflict with the existing relations of production. That is, the oppressed are exploited and the oppressors accumulate capital. Then begins an era of social revolution. The changes in the economic foundation lead sooner or later to the transformation of the whole immense superstructure. To summarize, Marx offers us a strictly atheistic, materialistic, economic explanation of the construction of human identity through social justice. Marx argues that, that man moves from a primitive form of consciousness into full self-consciousness through advances in economic 
production, and transitions in labor relations. This is how human identity is acquired. We become truly human through economic revolution. As workers gain power, assume control of production, abolish private property, and inaugurate an eschatological kingdom of a communist utopia. Ultimate economic justice. Social justice for all. Well, there are a number of observations we can make. Let me give just three. Number one, Marx had a keen sense of how greed can grip a global market economy. By God's common grace, Marx understood that money and social control can exercise a godlike power over people. And this can lead to the severe oppression of workers. But we didn't need Marx to tell us this. We know this as Christians, don't we? Paul says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. The people of the Old Testament knew something about the ruthless oppression of workers. But second, Marx's unbridled hope in the laboring class to bring about a peaceful utopia of economic prosperity is, I think, given the reality of human depravity, hopelessly naive. Capitalism is not the most basic cause of our frustrations when it comes to labor, whatever flaws capitalism may have. Rather, our labor is beset with frustration because first Adam rebelled as the head of creation against God. Wicked oppression in labor relations does need opposing. But sweat and thorns and thistles groan not for a communist revolution, but for what Paul calls the freedom of the glory of the children of God, Romans 8.21. What Marx offers is a secularized counterfeit of the consummation of God's redemptive plan, and in the process, no real hope for economic justice in this age. And third, Marx's conception of social justice through communism rests, I say, on a godless and reductionistic account of human identity as socially constructed. We are not defined by our economic relations or possessions, but by our relationship to God as our creator. And this has economic implications. But holding all economic power in common will neither save us nor bless society. As Augustine understood, God has made us for himself, and our restless hearts must rest in him as our Savior. And as we do, we must take him and not ourselves as the standard for economic justice in society. And yet, with James Cone, the restlessness continues. But what we see in Cone is humanity defined not in terms of a Marxist revolution, at least not that alone, but by another kind of revolution, what he called black power. Now, a few words of preparation here. Cone's context is the demeaning evils of racism in America at both individual and institutional levels. Frankly, I found myself sympathizing with the anguish and the anger with which he wrote, especially these two books, Black Theology and Black Power in 1969 and A Black Theology of Liberation in 1970. It is heartbreaking to acknowledge that if any population in America has ever known the dying of Jesus in the mortal flesh, if any has known the deep mystery of evil under the sovereign hand of God, it is our black brothers and sisters in Christ. Further, I sympathized with Cone's frustration over how the liberal theology in which he was trained amounted to no more than what he called, quote, an intellectual game unrelated to the issues of life and death, end quote. In that way, Cone, I think, shows us the desperate need for those who know the experience of being black in America to apply the riches of the Reformed tradition in ways that speak directly to African American life. Obviously, I'm not the one to do that. I also need to be crystal clear that during the civil rights era, many non-liberal, yes, 
even confessional Presbyterians were denigrating black brothers and sisters as they perpetuated racism and segregation and worse. I must also note that the vast majority of black churches in America, especially Bible-believing black churches, have either rejected or never embraced Cone's theology, however much they may affirm his concerns about racism. So we ought not think Cone's theology equals the theology espoused by black churches in America. Far from it. So with the vast majority of black churches in Philadelphia, I confess that the Spirit speaking in the Scriptures has something to say about racial issues. In addition, with them, I also say that one should not follow James Cone's theology or his social solution to racism in America. Because what Cone does is wed Marxist social criticism with an unbiblical modern theology to fight against racist oppression by any means necessary, to use the language of Malcolm X. To go back to our thesis, Cohn does not say that one's consciousness and with it one's identity is acquired through the power of the proletariat, but he says something close. He says that human identity especially that of black Americans, is acquired through the liberation of the oppressed in America, and this means through the struggle of what he calls black power. What is black power? Black power is, he says, the complete emancipation of black people from white oppression by whatever means black people deem necessary. This is black power the power of the black man to say yes to his own black being and to make the other accept him or be prepared for a struggle. Again, the struggle he has in mind is not first a class struggle, as it was with Marx, but a racial struggle, a struggle that envisions its own kind of earthly utopia for the black oppressed. As he put it, black theology believes that we are on the threshold of a new order, the order of a new black community. The black power movement is a transition in the black community from non-being to being. Now, whatever you may think about how best to achieve equal opportunity in life as well as in law for all people in America, you must understand that Cohn agreed with Marx in this, that one's position in society defines one's consciousness and consciousness determines reality. And in this point, Cohn was explicit in his reliance on Karl Marx. In his book, The God of the Oppressed, he writes, the importance of Marx for our purposes is his, is his insistence that thought has no independence from social existence. Theology arises out of life and thus reflects a people's struggle to create meaning in life. As this quote hints, in a way different than Marx, Cohn opts to use theology to promote his conception of racial social justice. Theology is for Cohn not the opiate of the people, as it was for Marx, but it is for Cohn a vehicle for attaining power and freedom from socioeconomic oppression. He writes these words, Christian theology is a theology of liberation. It is a rational study of the being of God in the world in light of the existential situation of an oppressed community, relating the forces of liberation to the essence of the gospel, which is Jesus Christ. This means that liberation is not only consistent with the gospel, but is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, to be clear, Cohn doesn't merely want to understand oppression in light of the gospel or in light of man's identity as God's image. Rather, he wants to reinterpret the gospel and reinterpret what it means to be God's image as the active liberation of oppressed people in America. To put it simply, he writes, Black theology knows no authority more binding than the experience of oppression itself. 
This alone must be the ultimate authority in religious matters. Concretely, this means that black theology is not prepared to accept any doctrine of God, man, Christ, or Scripture that contradicts the black demand for freedom now. Now, what is fascinating is that as much as Cohn drew on Marx for his sociological framework, the theologian that he found most useful was the giant of the 20th century, Karl Barth. Karl Barth advanced two things that Cohn was eager to use. Number one, Barth rejected theological liberalism on account of its, quote-unquote, natural theology. Now, for Barth, natural theology is any theology that's done apart from the Christ event of God's revelation. We're going to touch on that in a minute. But to be precise, what Bart really opposed was any direct revelation from God at all, whether in creation or in Scripture. Because for Bart, all claims to direct revelation were really indirect attempts to advance idolatrous human agendas. And Cohn sees this happening in the way that liberal theology would not and could not combat racism in America. And sadly, as I've mentioned, even in conservative circles, the Reformed community as well was not immune from perpetuating the status quo during the period of segregation. But in response, Cohn turns to Bart's account of the Christ event, construed as an act of revelation within God's own being. And he turns to the Christ event in order to redefine revelation as an act of of socioeconomic liberation. Okay, I realize that's a mouthful. Let's take this step by step. What is the Christ event for Bart? The Christ event for Bart is an eternally fulfilled realization of God and man's existence together in a freely willed act that is inaccessible to historical investigation. Okay, think Hegel's cosmic mind coming into self-consciousness along with creation. Imagine that happening in an instant and in a transcendent and ineffable way. That is what revelation is for Karl Barth. As Barth puts it, in the Christ event, God assumed a being as man into his being as God. This is a divine act that eternally fulfills God's purpose for humanity in a way that transcends all historical before and afters. God becomes God for us by taking humanity into his own life. This is what Revelation is, and it is highly idiosyncratic in Bart's theology. Now, Cohn looks at this, and he modifies it in two ways. Number one, instead of fulfilling all human identity, Cohn says the Christ event marks the ideal fulfillment of the identity of the racially oppressed. For Cohn, the Christ event means that God assumes the oppressed into his being as God. Number two, Cohn believes that Bart's Christ event is too transcendent. And so he recasts it as the event, the ongoing event of socioeconomic liberation in the context of history. In other words, as I say here, for Cohn, Bart's Christ event becomes a symbol of the way socioeconomic liberation realizes black identity, which is his shorthand for all oppressed people. Now, we are to decipher what he means when Cohn writes these words. God has been fully revealed in the man Jesus so that the norm of all existence is determined exclusively by him. When that existence is black existence, such an analysis has far-reaching implications. Through Christ, 
Okay, that is Christ as redefined by Bart, modified by Cone. Blacks are able to perceive the nature of being black and destroy the forces of non-being, white racism. To put it simply, by drawing on Karl Barth's Christology, Cone redefines humanity in terms of black liberation, and he redefines Jesus Christ as the ideal liberated oppressed man. This is what Cone means when he says, for example, Jesus is black, or God is God only for the oppressed. For Karl Marx, we achieve full consciousness and thus our human identity by triumphing over economic oppression. For Cone, one achieves black identity by triumphing over racist oppression. And Jesus Christ is the symbol of that hope. Well, a quick assessment. First, by God's common grace, Cohn was right to recoil from the racist, political, economic, and social exploitation of African Americans in this country. He keenly felt the biblical reality that sin leads us to hate ourselves and hate one another. But second, and tragically, he redefined the gospel as an act of self-realization achieved through a struggle for earthly power. And this denial of the true gospel tragically obscures the profound need of all people from liberation from sin and the dominion of death through the Christ of history. Because it is this gospel, the gospel of eternal salvation, that is the only power for racial reconciliation today. As Van Til writes, only when the black man and the white man, each for himself, seeks forgiveness for all his sins through the work of Christ on Calvary and by the power of the Holy Spirit will they treat each other as equals. Third, Cohn denied the gospel because he first redefined what it means to be human. He made black consciousness forged through racial revolution constitutive of human identity. In effect, in effect he asked, how are we the image of God? And he answered, we are the image of God only as we rebel against the structures of oppression and do so forever. Now, by contrast, I want to say we do not perfect our consciousness, we do not realize our identity through any social justice program. Rather, our identity as the image of God revealed in the Word of God is the foundation for pursuing social justice according to a redemptive, historically conditioned reading of Scripture. And this brings us at last to a few guidelines to direct us to a reformed account of social justice. I have six. First, I'll go quickly. Any reformed conception of social justice must begin with God's intrinsic righteousness and his sovereign purpose to reveal that righteousness in various ways across history for his glory. God is righteousness itself, immutably and eternally so. There is no higher principle, no greater norm or rule for social justice than the personal being of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And just as God's revelation takes various forms in history, so too does the revelation of God's righteousness. Leads us to a second point. God reveals the righteousness that He is in a spiritual and an eschatological or redemptive way in Christ's redemption accomplished and applied, in the concrete life of the institutional church, and in the visible consummation of the cosmos. And friends, this is a righteousness that the world neither understands nor embraces. It is the principle of our salvation. It is the comfort of every weary saint. It is revealed today mysteriously in the lives of Christians under the veil of their suffering in union with Christ. It is a righteousness that calls the church to faithful perseverance in the midst, in the midst of unjust treatment until God openly and triumphantly vindicates his justice at Christ's return. Third, God also reveals his righteousness in an outward way 
civic and temporal way in broader society through the operation of His common grace and through the Spirit-impelled labors of believers beyond the church. God has, as Creator, specified an order of righteousness in the world that He has made. And out of His holiness and grace, He has stipulated certain rights to His creatures. And yet, because of sin and because of the inscrutable nature of common grace, human efforts to promote these rights for every member of society will be halting and inconsistent and temporary but also laudable and desirable and possible. Therefore, we should seek to advance virtue and conformity to God's righteousness. We should seek to restrain evil in the world all that we can, especially among the poor and the afflicted and the oppressed, knowing that God overcomes evil in this age only through the power of the gospel. Fourth, both the revelation of God's righteousness in redemption and the advance of civil righteousness in society presuppose that all human beings are God's image, purposeful, valuable, dignified by Him. Many of you will know that Reformed theology distinguishes, when it comes to the image of God, between the image of God in the metaphysical or wider sense and the image of God in an ethical or narrow sense. All people are God's image in the wider sense. All people are religious creatures endowed with dignity and purpose, irrespective of the fall. But in the fall, Scripture teaches that we have lost the image of God in the narrow sense. We have lost righteousness and holiness before God. And yet through the gospel, this is what is renewed and confirmed Believers are inwardly renewed in Christ, in righteousness and holiness, as we await the bodily glorification commensurate with the kingdom of God. Each of these aspects of our anthropology bears on a Reformed conception of social justice. Namely, fifth, because all people are the image of God metaphysically in the wider sense, Christians should promote the order of justice that God has specified for the world. And because Christians have been renewed in the image of God ethically, in the narrow sense, we have the Spirit-wrought power to do so. Christ's kingdom demands that believers promote God's standards of justice throughout the world out of love for their fellow man, and yet do so in such a way that Christ's kingdom is not identified with any earthly program of social improvement or cultural renewal. And this is going to mean that we reject Marxist materialism and we address the causes and consequences of poverty in America and beyond. This means that we reject Cohn's anti-biblical theology and we address actual racism in society. This means that we both maintain the spiritual mission of the church as the church and support and promote the welfare of our neighbor of every color and creed, of every size and stage and location and condition of dependency. This means that there will be a paradox to our pursuit of social justice, perhaps more than one paradox. And so I say, sixth, social justice is not the gospel. But the gospel is the only true power for justice in the world. For it is the very thing that leads us to suffer injustice for the comprehensive good of our fellow man in body and in soul. Christ's kingdom is not a kingdom of social improvement in this world. But all social improvement in this world is to reflect the beauty and righteousness of Christ's kingdom. Believers will be sanctified and equipped in the Spirit to promote true justice on earth only if we are resolute in preserving and promoting the church's tasks of word, sacrament, and discipline. And believers ought to be zealous for justice on earth, come what may, because they love the King of heaven. I think Cornelius Van Til shows us the proper balance. He says, the individual believer has a comprehensive task, 
it is our duty not only to seek to destroy evil in ourselves and in our fellow Christians, but it is our further duty to seek to destroy evil in all of our fellow men. It may be, humanly speaking, hopeless that in some instances we should succeed in bringing them to Christ. This does not absolve us, however, from seeking to restrain their sins to some extent for this life. We must be active, first of all, in the field of special grace, the revelation of God's righteousness and redemption. But we also have a task to perform with respect to the destruction of evil in the field of common grace, the revelation of righteousness in civil society. Still further, we must note that our task with respect to the destruction of evil is not done if we have sought to destroy, if we have sought to fight sin itself everywhere we see it. We have the further obligation to destroy the consequences of sin in this world as far as we can. We must do good to all men, especially to those of the household of faith. To help relieve something of the sufferings of the creatures of God is our privilege and our task. So, friends, is there such a thing as reformed social justice? Yes. Perhaps we could define it this way. Reformed social justice is an effect of the Spirit of Christ in the hearts of Christians who, in union with Christ, forego demands for earthly power in order to promote the dignity and the outward estate of all people as God's image before His eschatological or end times righteousness is visibly revealed at the coming of Christ. Thankfully, God is pleased to work such justice in the world inscrutably, even as He bestows a kingdom of righteousness to His people inevitably. But no matter how much civil righteousness we pursue in this fallen world, no matter how much God in His mercy is pleased to grant, we do not attain our identity through it. Rather, we hold that our identity and the identity of all people as the image of God is the presupposition for our pursuit of social justice under Scripture's teaching concerning God's redemption and common grace. So may we be encouraged by the Spirit to live for heaven in our dealings with others on the earth. Let us proclaim the gospel, the only remedy for sin-sick souls. It is the power of salvation for all who believe because in it God's righteousness is revealed. But let us also oppose injustice wherever we find it, the exploitation of workers, the evil of racism and hidden prejudices, domestic and sexual abuse, assaults on the poor and the elderly, the horror of abortion, the hopelessness of gender confusion, and so much more. Let us extol God's righteousness in the world defined by His revealed law as those impelled by the Spirit of Christ, our righteousness. In the face of secular alternatives, let us promote this kind of social justice with wisdom and insight. Let us be Calvinists who sweat in service of the King. Let the Reformed work for reform that is biblically informed. And let us regard the dignity and worth of one another and work for and rejoice in each other's gifts and advancement as our very own. And as we do, let us remember the risen and indestructible Middle Eastern God-man who once had nowhere to lay his head, but who now reigns over every power and authority. One day he will return and gather all of his people into his eternal kingdom of righteousness and peace. Social justice will not get us there, but social justice is part of the calling of those who will be there. Thank you to the heralds, thank you special guests, and thank you all for listening. Amen.